Hello, my name is Mike Little. I'm the author of Tipping Point, The Coming Global Weather Crisis, a book from Amazon. I'm looking at an example of the ice records that I started studying uh, five, six, seven years ago. And you can see the blue at the top is temperature, Celsius, uh, variations from the norm. And the green is CO2. And down at the bottom, red is dust in the atmosphere. And this is basically what happened in the Antarctica uh, during that time frame. And this is a pretty strong gauge on worldwide temperature. And this is what I examined. And it was just very confusing. I looked at this for a couple years and I made no sense. I'm looking at a uh, temperature chart of the last half million years or so. And it's showing a lot of peaks, at least four distinct peaks. These are periods of maximum temperature over that whole period. And what is interesting to note is about 93% of the time, mankind's been locked in an ice age over that period of time. Only about 7% of the time have we been in a, in a warm period like we are today. And most of that 7% it's the last 10,000 years because most of the warm periods have been very sharp and, and short in duration. You know, they went up and they went back down. So this is what I was looking at. I was wondering why we have peaks and why it drops and then why does it peak again. And what really, really interests me is as it gets warm, what is the tipping point that causes it to drop cold again. You know, if you're getting warmer, why does it turn and drop? You know, why does it get cold? That is the essence of my book and my idea. But let's look at this chart a little bit. So minus 104,000 years ago, it was hot. 80,000 years ago, 80,000 years later, it was hot again. Then about 85,000 years later, it was another warm period. And then about 110,000 years after that, there was another warm period. And then right now it's been 127,000 years since the last warm period. And uh, we are in a long period of mild temperatures at this time. Because 10,000 years ago, temperature was spiking. It was heading up. I mean, it was getting hotter quick. But then it just stopped getting hot and stayed moderate for the last 10,000 years. And this has allowed mankind to develop his civilizations, his civilization today. You know, if this warm period had not been there, we would not have had to. Another chart that I've prepared shows the temperature variations over the last 130,000 years. And this shows some very peculiar trends. You can see that the last temperature maximum was 128,000 years ago. And then we had a long cooling period of about 110,000 years. And that would be the trend that is the solid black line. But variations on this trend are very strange. One of the first variations was 116,000 years ago when Yellowstone erupted and temperatures dropped for about 9,000 years. It's a runaway drop in temperature. Uh, pretty much what, hap what happens after every uh, temperature maximum. Then we had what I consider to be temperature spikes, methane spikes is what I call them. And this is periods of warming during the ice age when uh, you know you'd expect it to be very cold. And these methane spikes are caused by methane hydrate degassing events on the uh, continental shelves of the, of the world's oceans. Uh, methane Hydrate is, a, is like ice, and it holds methane captured captive, and it he holds it captive uh, about a thousand foot down in the ocean floors. And when the oceans lower, you know, four or five hundred foot, these methane hydrates are no longer stable, and they start degassing when warm water goes over them. So what happens is these methane hydrate deposits start just explosively degassing. You know, they're pretty much like a, um, a 
trail of gunpowder. If you light one end, it's pretty much going to go to the other end, and that's what a methane hydrate deposit's like. You know, once one end starts, one one end starts going off. You know, that whole thing is probably just going to degas, and all this stuff's going to go in the atmosphere, and it's going to get warm very quickly, because methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, something like 20 times more effective than carbon dioxide itself. So we got a bunch of spikes. We have an eruption about 75,000 years ago and a corresponding drop in temperature afterwards. Uh, kind of like the uh, Yellowstone eruption, just not so uh, severe. And then about 24,000 years ago was the coldest period in the last half million years, pretty much. And then right after that, it was the end of the Ice Age and the ice began melting. Right after that, there's a younger Dryas event where it stopped warming and got cold for like 2,000 years. And it's uh, pretty evident that this was probably some volcanoes. There was a super volcano in Europe and there was also multiple volcanoes worldwide during this period. Uh, volcanoes were very active during this period so it's just likely that the combination of all of them caused the global cooling. And then it started getting warm again. And about 10,000 years ago, it started moderating. Temperatures moderated for the last 10,000 years. Uh, the question is why? Uh, so I have two major questions. Why did it moderate for the last 10,000 years? And why do we have temperature maximums that shift into periods of cold? You know, why does it get cold? Why does the Ice Age start? These are my questions. You know, one of the most interesting things I found from studying the Ice Age is how much man has affected the weather. It is very possible that man changed the course of weather 10,000 years ago. And we had no intention of doing so and had no idea what we were doing. We did it when we invented fire. And we started pumping probably billions and billions of tons of smoke and soot into, straight into the atmosphere of northern Europe and Asia, the world's biggest landmass. And when we did that, that affected how much uh, sunlight these areas could receive, particularly in the wintertime when there's a real strong inversion over that area. And an inversion caps off smoke and crap in the atmosphere. It just prevents it from going away. And it just builds up and up and up until you get concentrations that are just severe. Uh, when you get major fires like they had in San Diego area uh, you know, 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, the smoke was so strong that it just stayed over just like, a, just like the stratus that's normal in San Diego. Well, uh, instead of stratus, it was just a big black cloud that stretched out probably about 500 miles out to sea and all the way and up to the mountains over in the east. But the smoke had a huge effect. It was just depressing when you can't see the sun. But one of the things that really affects weather is albedo. How much ref reflectivity does surfaces have? Okay, one of them is ice. And ice and snow, they would vary up to from 30-40% all the way up to 70-80-90%. You know, because up in the northern latitudes, ice and snow is not going to receive or let very much uh, energy through. You know, if you got white ice, you know, it's got some air in it, it's not clean, it's not going to uh, prevent, it's, it's going to prevent the uh, energy from hitting the ground. It's going to be potent effect. So let's take a look. Water, it absorbs most everything. Soil, yeah. Forest, oh yes. Meadows, they all do quite a bit. You know, about 90% of the insulation, the incoming sunlight is absorbed by the ground. Crops, wet sand, dry soil, desert, you know, all these, you know, absorb most of it, 80%. 70%, 70 to 80. But then you start getting into the cloud types and ice. And let's look at stratus. Stratus is like 40 to 50% effective. Well, I think if you have a really 
thick stratus layer that you're probably getting up to 80 90 percent because uh, i've seen multiple days on on occasions when uh, you know it'd be like 50 degrees at night it's a strong stratus layer in san diego you know there's sun above it's it's the middle of summer but it doesn't get up to you know above 55 during the day and it just stays cloudy and gloomy and that's because these stratus layer prevents the energy from hitting the ground it's very effective you know and what do you have over a glacier what do you have over ice you have a very strong inversion you know it's very cold at the surface and as it gets higher the uh, uh, air gets warmer okay it's it's one of those occasions when everything's turned on its head and if you're having to burn a fire in that area guess what it gets stuck right in that inversion and so the ice and glaciers they had a uh, like a blanket above them of very cold air this very very cold air was very effective in preventing sunlight from hitting the ground because it generally created a really thick stratus fog layer and that's what these things do these inversions you often mostly have very strong cloud banks and this cloud bank will prevent that sunlight from hitting the ground uh, you know so what I'm trying to say is 10,000 years ago when it should have been getting warmer very much faster uh, we pumped so much smoke and stuff into the atmosphere that it packed into those inversions and these glaciers instead of retreating they started advancing again or at least not advancing but at least they started remaining in place you know, or else they would have been gone 10,000 years ago when the uh, heating period was at its max. So when you have a very s cold air mass at the surface, as you would in a glacier, temperatures would basically get colder the more you get towards the center of the air mass. So the very coldest conditions would be right at the center of the glacier. And pressure would be inverse so the very highest pressures would be right at the center of the glacier air mass you so you would see higher pressures than you have anywhere in the world today but that would be a high pressure at the surface and this would be a very shallow low shallow high pressure center up aloft instead of having a low you have a instead of having a high aloft you have a low because they reverse with height generally. Uh, so, you know, if you have a high at the surface, you have a low aloft. Uh, generally, there are some exceptions to this rule, but that is uh, fairly firm. Uh, but that high, but that low aloft would be very intense, and you would have a very strong jet associated with that. And that's going to basically be a regional jet. It's going to stay as long as the glacier does, and it stays for 100,000 years. So you get very few movements of polar jets, polar fronts, polar jets. The jet stream would probably pretty much be non-existent. So this is, a, is what happens when the uh, ice melts in the Arctic. So does it happen that first winter? Does it happen uh, when? Well, we don't know. But I would theorize that it's probably going to happen the first really strong cold winter over North America and Europe. So it's going to be very extremely cold over the continents and over uh, the Arctic. It's going to be fairly warm because that's fairly warm water. You know, if you don't have ice sitting on the surface, the Arctic warms very rapidly because there's actually a lot of warm water in the Arctic, but most of it's around 800 to 1,000 foot down or deeper than that. And if you get rid of all the ice at the surface, guess what? That warm water comes to the surface. So this would have a severe change in weather, severe change in atmospheric patterns, and produce perhaps even a hurricane at the North Pole. So maybe a hurricane in a whirlpool up there that would last for 100,000 years. Kind of interesting phenomena. Check out my book, Tipping Point, The Coming Global Weather Crisis. Michael Little, and that would be at Amazon.